Please be seated, friends. And good morning to you, and it's a pleasure to gather us uh, together as God does as this faith community each Sunday, unity each Sunday, and we are glad, we are glad if this is your very first time with us, we trust that folks around you are already helping you to settle in, and we welcome those joining us by live stream this morning as well. Uh, I'm Reverend Philip Newman, one of the ministers that serves the congregation here and the community, and and uh, I bring hello as well as uh, the rest of our team, Reverend Simon LeSueur, our Minister of Music, Gerald Van Wyck, and our incredible choir, uh, who offer their gift of music uh, so faithfully. We are uh, a community that provides things uh, we trust for those who are here on a Sunday, such as a nursery. Uh, if you are looking for that help for three and under, uh, there is our uh, caregivers just waiting downstairs behind uh, taking the stairs behind the tech booth down to the lower level Sunday club for those four and older and for those four and older and if this happens to be a first time for your uh, child to Sunday club today there's a little card in the pew that gives a bit of safety information for the child just have the child bring it uh, with them when it's time to move on to uh, Sunday club this morning now, at the end of worship, there's an opportunity to pause uh, in our church hall for a uh, time to continue our conversations and, and enjoy a beverage together. Hope that you can linger there a little bit. There is a welcome table there that uh, attempts to answer your questions uh, about activities and events and the nature of our congregation. And uh, they are just uh, glad to welcome you this morning. Now, by way of uh, announcements, <clears throat> I point out to you from time to time that in the pew is an emergency evacuation plan. I'm not asking you to read it now, but uh, it is to read it now, but uh, it is there. We invite you to become familiar with it. It, it helps identify just which uh, section you're seated and where you might head to uh, uh, an exit in the event of an emergency. Uh, coming up uh, through uh, uh, later today, uh, we're partnering with West Bend Secondary School students who are offering a bake sale uh, in our space uh, from 2 till 4 this afternoon. So if you're looking for some sweets or you happen to be back in the neighborhood, stop in and uh, help them out. Uh, Holy Week services. We stand now on the threshold of Holy Week. We're going, moving through it. We have uh, not only today Palm Sunday and Palm uh, Crosses that you hopefully have received. There's lots. If you have, would like to take one uh, to a friend or a neighbor, there should be some at the end of service at the exits uh, to do just that. We head to Monday just that. We head to Monday Thursday service, Good Friday morning service. The Good Friday service service will be streamed and uh, there is a brightly colored postcard in your bulletin that you can take and offer an invitation to someone uh, for any of the whole uh, Holy Week services and certainly for Easter. The uh, uh, after worship today, when you head into the church hall, you'll see that there is a pre-Easter flea market sale uh, ready for you. Some, if you're looking for that special hat for Easter, you just might find it there. I know I am. I'm going to stop around and take a look. I think Jerry and I are looking for matching hats this, this year, so we'll see what we find. And uh, other, there are many other announcements. I'll let you read through them. Uh, but speaking to two announcements is uh, Simon. And then uh, Jerry wants to let us know more about the concert coming up. More about the concert coming up. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Kim? We'll have to use this. My battery's just died. Thank you. All right. Um, yeah, good morning. Um, two very, very brief announcements. Um, the first one, uh, you'll find more information in your bulletins, but we are offering a marriage course starting May, uh, May 5th, and that is um, for anyone who's in a long-term relationship um, who would like to... Uh, who would like some space and some time to be able to have, uh, to, to invest and strengthen your relationship. And uh, so that's coming up May 5th, and have a look in your bulletins, all the details are there. 
And um, the second one is I would like to draw attention to, uh, to Philip's beautiful uh, lapel. Um, <laughs> so starting today uh, in the sanctuary, you'll find um, these, uh, these commemorative pins that are celebrating these commemorative pins that are celebrating and marking our 100th anniversary. And um, they are snazzy, and um, they're a great conversation starter. I'll be talking in my sermon today about those awkward conversations we have about church. Um, this is a great way to start one of those. <laughs> and um, the suggested, it's a su- suggested donation of $10, um, and you can get those uh, at the welcome table after the service. This Good Friday at uh, 2 p.m., uh, our choir, uh, with a, along with the Pacific Spirit Choir and orchestra and soloists who are, right as I speak, flying in from Berlin and Chicago, are going to present Haydn's Creation. It's such a celebrative, joyful work, um, and it's so pictorial. You'll see eagles soaring. You'll see whales uh, swimming through the water. You'll hear about cooing doves and nightingales, and uh, it's a wonderfully distinct gales. And uh, it's a wonderfully descriptive, uh, delightful work. Um, so please uh, bring friends and neighbors. Um, and tickets will be for sale in the uh, church hall afterwards or throughout the week at the church office or at, online at the Pacific Spirit Choir. Snazzy and nightingales. Two words I haven't heard in a long time. <laughs> you will be aware that... Uh, those of us who help to lead Stephen Ministry are, uh, ha- are looking for a, a new class to train beginning this fall, and uh, we are uh, holding an information session today. We know a number of you are thinking about it. Uh, some of you have already committed to it. Uh, right after worship, uh, as soon as we can get going, you might grab a cup of tea or coffee and head right into the lounge. Uh, for an information session where we would love to let you know a bit more about uh, know a bit more about uh, what that might be to be involved in Stephen ministry. Uh, one of our Stephen ministers, uh, Barry Kenna, uh, on video now offers a reflection of the meaning it has had for him. Let's take a look. Barry Kenna, and I've been a member of this church for three or four years now, and I was one of the first to go through the Stephen Ministry training. Everyone goes through a period of distress or, or a, a rough patch in your life, and sometimes it's pretty helpful to have somebody come alongside you to listen and to be with you as you go through that patch. And I love the analogy of uh, a cup of cold water to somebody who is a cup of cold water to somebody who is involved in uh, a journey, and I think that's what sums up what I think a Stephen minister is. We're not there to come up with all the solutions or whatever, but we are there to be a compassionate listener, heavy on the listening. And um, everything that we discuss as a care receiver, a caregiver rather, and a care receiver, are totally held in confidence. And there's no one that knows the name of your care receiver but you. Okay. You don't have to be a student of the Old Testament or New Testament or prayer warrior to be a Stephen minister. The training and the materials and the trainers, the attention to detail and the quality of the presentations and the, all the, the uh, teaching aids are absolutely first class. And uh, the real bonus is that you're going to learn a whole bunch of skills that we would apply to our um, relationship with, we would apply to our um, relationship with our care receiver, but you also get to adopt those skills to your own life, i.e., active listening, uh, establishing boundaries or assertiveness. All those are very helpful uh, uh, tools for me and my fellow Stephen ministers' uh, lives. So that's a real bonus. Here's another terrific bonus to being a Stephen minister, and that is the fellowship and the interaction that you have with the fellow student, uh, Stephen ministers as you're going through the teaching and as you're going through the meetings a couple of times a month. That's been a great blessing to me. Uh, 
So if any of this information makes some sense to you, and possibly you would like to explore it a little bit further, I'd love you to think about the chance of being a cup of cold water for somebody. And talk to uh, Allie or Gwen, talk to uh, Allie or Gwen or Kim or Philip or one of the Stephen ministers that are currently around the church and see if that might be a fit for you. I know it has been a blessing to all those that I have been involved with and it could be for you. This morning, I invited one of our uh, Stephen leaders, uh, Ali Murray, to come forward, light the candle, and one of our Stephen uh, ministers, Barb Wilson. Don't be shy. <laughs> and uh, this morning, as they light the candle, uh, we just think of the over one and a half million persons whose lives have been helped in a caregiving, uh, care receiving relationship within Stephen ministry. Uh, over the years that it's been in operation in uh, a number of in operation in uh, a number of countries around the world. May that light of caring continue to shine. I invite you to join with me in our call to worship this morning. The Lord be with you. Jesus is at the gates. Let us go to greet him. We join the crowds of old waving branches and giving honor. Honor, honor and praise, praise and glory are yours, now and forever. Hosanna! Hosanna! were 
into the cross. And so there's a, a lot of the story caught up in the palm crosses that are ours this morning. Good reason for us to pray. And so let's pray together. Stay near to us, O oh God, as we journey, God, as we journey through this week. We are not people of great power, Holy Creator, except as we are empowered by you and given the resources to make a great difference in a multitude of lives today. We are a people of resistance and hope. And today we raise our palms high in celebration of the one who came in compassion and humility. The one who lived among us in radical welcome. The one who rode into town on a colt to remind us of these great strengths. The one who became obedient to the point of death, ride into our hearts again, and help us to remember that your love for us is our great and indomitable, great and indomitable power. We pray in the name of Jesus, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And even though we are entering Holy Week and we know the emotions of those crowds change and their faith in Jesus is cracked open as they're not sure what to make, we nonetheless affirm our faith this morning. So I invite us to stand this morning. So I invite us to stand together and to share in the words of a new creed. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. If you trust in God, we are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Let us remain standing as we sing. who are here this morning uh, to make their way forward so we can pray with you, pray for you because we love you and, uh, and we always, always, always want to make sure that you all know that, um, that we have your back, that we, we're here for you and with you.
How are you doing this morning? Tired? Okay. Maxi? Yeah, Thomas? Good. Okay, good, good. Great. All right. Good. Great. All right. Let me pray with you, and, uh, and then you can head off with um, Debbie and Dylan. Um, God, I just thank you so much for uh, the work that you are doing in and through these amazing young people. God, may you help us as a community um, teach them so that they can do the stuff that you did. God, in their schools, in their communities, in their homes. Um, help them, God, to, uh, to live in love as you did. And God, as they head off uh, into Sunday Club, may your Holy Spirit uh, go with them. God, may your Holy Spirit uh, guide each and every single one of us in all that we do. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name for the sake of your glory and your kingdom. Amen. All right, have fun. For me, has been um, has been one of the main ways in which I've come to to know God. One of the uh, one of the amazing opportunities I've had in the last month I was to spend some time in in Korea with Korean Christians, and they introduced me to uh, a practice that I want to share with all of you. That's going to be. That's going to be a little bit different, um, but that's okay, right? <laughs> so what I want to invite all of us to do, um, and this is what they call a whisper prayer, and um, it's for each one of us um, to, to pray the prayers that are on our hearts. And, um, and what they do uh, in their churches is they, they whisper them so that the prayer... It's at that volume where it is only barely perceptible to your own ear. Does that make sense? So um, I'll invite you in a time of prayer and um, I will close off um, by praying. <laughs> Let's pray. So God, you hear the prayers that are on our hearts. And God, the prayers that echo the longings of our lives. And God, our kingdoms bump into each other all the time. And so God, we ask that your will would be done, not ours. And God, we lift up 
the names of all those who have asked to be kept in bed in prayer, who need extra support, extra love. God, you know each one of them by name. And you know those of us, God, who've just simply not had the strength to step up and to say, I need help. And so, God, on this triumphant Palm Sunday, May you process into our lives. May you process into this community. May you process into this world. And all of this for your glory. That this world might know the peace that comes from you. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus, the Anointed One. Amen. in the life of what God wants us to be as God's people. And so let our offerings be received.
The, the offertory anthem, Ubi Caritas, is based on an old, thousand-year-old tune in poetry, but its words are so relevant today, and it embodies, in many respects, the beliefs of the United Church, where two or three are gathered, where we are gathered together in spirit, there is the presence of God. And it's set by a, uh, one of the finest modern composers, so almost as good as our own Jason Nett, um, uh, Ola Yelo.
Good morning. As we prepare to hear God's word, let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you hear with joy, what you say to us today. Amen. The reading this morning is from Paul's letter to the Philippians. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hear what the Spirit of the Church is saying to the Church. Thanks to the Church.
Thank you. Thank you for that. That was really great. <laughs> Do you want to know what I really think about church? No. No. <laughs> like, really? really think, like honestly think about church. So I was getting my hair cut a few months ago, and um, the older gentleman to my left leans over, and that was his question to me. Do you really, do you really want to know what I think about church? No. <laughs> I... <laughs> So now because I'm Canadian and, my, and I'm generally polite, um, I, I said, I said, oh, no, sure. <laughs> I've been dying to hear. Um, on the inside, though, every single part of me was like just screaming, no. <laughs> my head could, it was going in every single direction of, of where is he going to take this? And... Um, <coughs> I think my anxiety levels were so high that I honestly, legitimately have no idea what he said. I just smiled and was like, that's really interesting. Can we go back to like that weird separation when you're getting your hair cut and you just, yeah, just let it be. Uh, but you know what's even worse, let it be. Uh, but you know what's even worse is uh, when people find out that I'm a minister. Um, I can't tell you the amount of social gatherings or, um, or barber chairs that I've been in um, where, you know, people are, are, are chatting and they're, they're like swearing up a storm and, and then they go, so what do you do for a living? <laughs> Sometimes if it's really excessive, I'll just say, oh, I'm, I'm in like networking. <laughs> It's a really great party trick, though, when you, when you just say, oh, uh, I, 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 I'm a minister. I kid you not, like, the room goes really, really quiet, and then inevitably someone will come up and just, just like, really sheepishly say, hey, I, well, I'm, uh, I'm really sorry about my language. Language. Um... <laughs> There's only one barber in my whole life who, um, after he found out that, uh, that I was a minister, uh, stayed really true to who he was and just said, whoa, that's awesome. But in those three words, managed to slip in four swear words. <laughs> but has that ever happened to you? Have you ever found yourself in a situation, maybe it's a dinner party, um, with people that you know, maybe maybe not so well, and inevitably the, the, the topic turns to faith. And you sit there feeling really, really uncomfortable, hoping that no one outs you for being a church member. Right? There's always that really nice friend that says, oh, Don goes to church. And you're like, no, no, actually I don't. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Have you ever sat there and had the confidence to say to someone, I, I, yeah, I go to church only to find yourself facing someone who's quite upset or quite angry at the church? So what do we do with that? How do we stay true to our faith? How do we not just casually take off our West Van United 100 pin when we go into a social gathering? How do we walk when the walking 
is hard. Let's pray. A God, we gather here. A God, we gather here in your house. And God, we thank you for the work that you are doing in our lives. And God, not just in our lives as individuals, but in our life as a community of faith. And God, may you continue to speak into our hearts. I ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Palm Sunday. Today is, is, is Palm Sunday. Um, the, the classic traditional reading for Palm Sunday is uh, the, the reading when, when Jesus triumphantly process, pro- processes uh, into, uh, into Jerusalem. And he's in Jerusalem. And he's surrounded by crowds that are absolutely adoring him. They're shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Yet five days later, those same crowds are shouting Barabbas, Barabbas, Barabbas. In five days, these crowds go from adoring and celebrating and worshiping this king wanting him dead. How does that happen? But this sermon is not about these crowds. This sermon is about Jesus. This sermon is about Jesus. And this sermon is about how Jesus walked through the crowds that loved him and how Jesus walked through the crowds who hated him. This sermon is about how you and I are called to walk when the walking is hard. Because walking can be really hard. Now in this passage, we encounter what is to me the heart of what it means to follow Jesus. The reason I chose this passage today instead of our usual traditional passage is because this passage points to the way that we're called as followers of Christ to live and love in the world around us. Now, a few years ago, um, every year the, the, the official board of this community of faith gathers, uh, usually in June, um, for some visioning and, uh, and, 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 and prayer around what is it that God is calling us to do. And um, several years ago at this retreat, uh, the facilitator asked everyone to gather into small groups and to ask each other, why is it that you come to church? And every little group was supposed to... to and every little group was supposed to, to, to report back. And, and I still remember one, back, uh, one group coming back and, and, and reporting quite, quite sheepishly. The woman who reported said, well, um, it's a little uncomfortable because we all thought we came to church for the right reason. And, and well, there's one person in, in our group who really kind of put us all to shame. Um, this person said that the reason they come to church is because they feel called to be part of this community, to use their gifts that God has given them to help this community be a beacon to the North Shore. I mean, how do you beat that, right? (laughs) But here's the really, really interesting thing, is that everyone else in that group 
said that they come to church because over and over they are the only Christian in their circle. And maybe that's you. And maybe that's you. Maybe you find yourself being the only Christian in your book club. Maybe you go exercise with a group of people and you find yourself being one of the only people who spend their Sunday mornings in church. I've asked the young people before, you know, what what do do your friends think you do on a Sunday morning? And they got really uncomfortable and most of them admitted that very few of their friends know that they go to church. They just said, well, It's pretty easy because most of us aren't expected to be up by noon anyway, so I just get a little bit of a head start and no one knows it. But being a Christian can be pretty lonely. Now, where I grew up in Quebec City, it used to be that um, everyone went to church all the time. In fact, and I think I've mentioned this, in fact, um, people would worry about you if you didn't go to church. Nowadays, people worry about you if you do go to church. (laughs) Right? Like, oh, I saw the neighbors went to church. Something must be really wrong. Oh, this passage, Philippians 2, is the answer to this question. How do we walk when the walking is hard? How do we walk faithfully when we're sitting in a book club and everyone is making fun of what it means to be a fun of what it means to be a Christian? What does it mean to walk faithfully when you're in the gym and a friend comes up to you and throws a newspaper article and says, this is what you stand for? This passage in Philippians 2, what's really, really interesting is that some translations begin it with, in all your relationships, let the mind, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, in all your relationships. In every, what Paul is saying here is that in every single interaction that you have with another human being, let let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. In every single relationship. That means with your parents who are aging. That means with your kids who just seem a little too busy to pick up the phone and check in with how you're doing. That means with the young waiter who's just trying really hard and still got your order wrong for the third time. That means with the bus driver who stepped on the gas before you sat down. That means with the healthcare worker who just doesn't seem to actually really care about you. In all your relationships, Let the same mind be in you that is in Christ Jesus. Now let's break that down. Let the same mind, not the same body, not the same sense of humor, let the same mind be in you. Let the same mind that was in Christ Jesus, your mind, let the same mind be in you. 
that was in Christ Jesus. Now let the same mind, now let the same mind be in you. What Paul is talking about here is not let that same mind be accessible to you when you need it. Paul is not saying let that same mind be within reach. He's saying let that same mind be in you. That was in Christ Jesus. And all of it starts with the word, one word, with the word let. Let the same mind. Allow. Create space. Surrender. Now what does that mean? To surrender. What does that mean for you to surrender? To surrender in such a way that you would let the same mind that was in Christ Jesus be in you. Well, I was listening to one of the theological greats. His name is Dallas Willard. And what Dallas Willard talks about is this concept of carrying the cross. Now you've often heard, you may have heard people joke, actually, maybe you've never heard people joke and I just have weird friends. Um, you may have heard people joke about it, like, oh yeah, you know, I'm, I'm going down to the desert, you know, that's my cross to carry. Um, that's not carrying your cross. Carrying your cross is not, carrying your cross is not putting up with the neighbor next door and their dog that won't stop barking. Carrying your cross is not waking up early in the morning, even if you don't feel like it. Carrying the cross is surrendering your entire system of thinking so that God's will would be done. Now, I'll admit it, I have, um, I have my own little kingdom. Um, it's one of the most amazing things to see our, our son Laurier turn one uh, this week. And it's, incredible, even at, and it's incredible, even at the age of one, how he's already building his own little kingdom. Um, he was playing with this mirror that we should probably attach a little bit better to the wall. And, um, and I just foresaw the whole thing crashing down on him. And so I just, I picked him up and he treated me like I was... I was going to say Hitler, but uh, <laughs> almost, right? Like, he was just so devastated. And I realized, like, you really, really want to play with that mirror. Even at his young age, he is starting to build his own little kingdom. And so we all have our little kingdoms, don't we? These little places where we have a sphere of influence. And sometimes when my kingdom comes close to your kingdom, we create, we create really beautiful things. But sometimes when my kingdom comes close to your kingdom, we create conflict. And what Dallas Willard talks about when he talks about surrender is he talks about surrender being the understanding that we are going to say, God, I love my little kingdom, but I don't want to be on the throne of my kingdom. I want you to be on the throne of my kingdom. Because the problems that you are calling me to solve cannot be solved if I'm sitting on my throne. 
Let me say that again. The problems that God is calling you to solve cannot be fixed. If you are sitting on your throne and so surrender If your mind and your will is the center of our being, then surrender is saying, God, you come and sit on my throne. You can have it. Because I want for your will to be done, not mine. Let your will be done. We pray that every week. We pray that, but do we mean that? So what does this look tangibly? What does this look like practically as you go out into this world? How do you allow yourself to be renewed by the transforming of your mind? Well, here's a really silly example, and I'm going to encourage all of you to try this, okay? I tried this this week, um, and actually, it was amazing to see what emerged. Um, All of this came because I saw there was an older gentleman on a bicycle, and he crossed the road, and he had the right of way, and uh, he nearly got hit by a car. Now, thankfully, he didn't. But you know what happened is I watched him bike, for another few minutes down the road, and I could see him like going like this, and like he was just kept biking, and he was so angry, and I realized like, okay, yeah, we all realized like, okay, yeah, we all have really angry self-talk, not all the time, but I'm sure once in your life that you found yourself thinking, how dare they? <laughs> see the awkward oops? <laughs> But if our self-talk is negative, when we talk about you know, walking the talk, if our self-talk is negative, then our walking will be informed by that. Now I feel like that's like a, like a tongue twister a little bit. Um, does that make sense? So if your self-talk is negative, and we're called to walk the talk, then the walking that will come out of that negative self-talk will likely be negative. So here's what I tried, based off of this man's experience, who rightfully almost got hit by a car, well not rightfully got hit by a car, well not rightfully got hit by a car, um, was rightfully angry about almost being hit by a car, um, to see his self-talk made me realize, what if I tried for 30 minutes to find something good in every single relationship, in every single human being that I see? What if I tried this for 30 minutes? Not even people that I know, I was driving in the car. And so I saw a young man who was laughing. And I said out loud, because I was in the car, I said, I really like the freedom that you have to laugh out loud. And it it felt kind of nice. And then I saw a bus full of people, and I thought, hey, you know what? I like all of you guys. You're taking, I like all of you guys. You're taking public transit. And it felt really nice. And as I did this over and over and over, it started to develop in me a compassion for people's stories. It was the weirdest thing. But I saw a woman carrying really heavy bags. And my heart this time actually broke for her. I wanted to pull over and help her carry her bags. No, I didn't, right? Because I'm like that. (laughs) But when you start to think and start to allow the same mind that was in Christ Jesus to be in you, you start to develop new patterns of compassion. 
Now, I'll be, I, I have to be 100% transparent. I did let it slip once, where I was trying to be po- it slip once, where I was trying to be positive, and I just, my first thing was, hey, I really like how you didn't put your flasher on before you cut me off. <laughs> we're not perfect, right? But we're trying. And so here's my encouragement to you this week. And even earlier than this week, But as you head out into the community, I invite you to say out loud the things that you like and that you see in the people that you don't even know. If you can do that for five minutes, that's really great. But more importantly than that, pay attention to what it starts to do to your self-talk. Pay attention to what it starts to do to your interactions, to your interactions and your love of people. Imagine the kind of community that we would be if we allow ourselves to have this kind of mind transplant. Imagine what your next book club meeting would look like if you sat there and as people are complaining about the church or about Christians, Imagine what the conversation would be like if you suddenly had this deep sense of compassion for the people across the, for the people across the table. Imagine what this world would look like if we all walked through crowds the way Jesus walked through crowds. Not worrying about ourselves, but surrendering to the good and perfect will of God. Amen.
But brothers and sisters in Christ, in all your relationships, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. And may you go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.